Hi, I'm Paul Jay, and welcome to the Analysis.News podcast. Please don't forget, at the top of the website, there's a donate button, and that's the only way we keep going, is when people go and donate there. Be back in a second. There's much in common between Trump and Reagan. In 2016, Frank Rich wrote a piece for the New York Magazine titled, What the Donald Shares with the Ronald. Rich wrote Reagan's and Trump's opposing styles belie their similarities of substance. Both have marketed the same brand of outrage to the same angry segments of the electorate, faced the same jeering press, attracted some of the same battlefront allies, Roger Stone, Paul Manafort, Phyllis Shafley, offended the same elites, including two generations of Bushes, outmaneuvered similar political adversaries, and espoused the same conservative populism built broadly on the pillars of jingoistic nationalism, nostalgia, contempt for Washington, and racial resentment. I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Ronald Reagan. While the name of Trump is never mentioned in the new Showtime documentary series, The Reagans, Trump is a presence that constantly comes to mind as you watch this revealing and riveting bio of Ronald and Nancy Reagan. We will make America great again. After that, Reagan owned the heart of the party. The creation of the now revered President Ronald Reagan, whose roots are to be found in corruption, racism, and corporatism, shows that not only is Trump not an anomaly, but he walks in the footsteps of a right-wing construct that marries religion, hypernationalism, racism, and hatred of all things socialist to achieve tax cuts for the rich and an undoing of the New Deal and the social safety net. As a voice in the film says, Reagan was able to sell the party of big business as the party of hard-working white people. The veneration of Reagan before and after his death, including by many leaders of the Democratic Party, helped till the soil for the rise of Trump. It's a foundational myth of our era. The Reagans shows just how much Trumpism is a copy of Reaganism and is essential viewing for anyone trying to understand this perilous historical moment. In the preface to his book, The 18th Brumaire, Marx wrote, that the purpose of his essay was, quote, to demonstrate how the class struggle in France created circumstances and relationships that made it possible for a grotesque mediocrity to play a hero's part. And of course, the famous quote about such heroes, that they, quote, appear for the first time as tragedy and the second as farce. Ronald Reagan said himself, if you are not a good actor, you cannot be a good president. You would not have got an elected president without Nancy. So your position has made it impossible. Doing everything we can. Doing everything we can. The Reagans tells the story of a mediocre actor who plays the part of an affable American hero that grotesquely helps usher in an unbridled form of capitalism. Priority one for the Reagan administration was the economic situation. My father liked the idea that if you let rich people hang on to more of their money, this will benefit all of society. It's an era where the digital revolution asserts itself and the power of the American working class is eroded by globalization on high-tech steroids. President Reagan was the smiling face that made it all seem so acceptable, so patriotic, so American. The myth of the Reagan presidency creates much of the framework for the politics of today. A new Reagan, a new Trump, is sure to rise again if we don't change the political dynamic where the Democratic Party, when it forms the government, submits to the power of finance and inequality grows and sets the table for the far right once again. Now joining us is the director and writer of The Reagans, Matt Turnauer, who's also the filmmaker of Valentino, The Last Emperor, which was shortlisted for an Academy Award for Best Documentary Feature, and Where's My Roy Kahn, another must-see if you want to understand the political forces that gave us Trump. Thanks for joining us, Matt. Thank you. 
So uh, talk in broad terms, first of all, about why you think the importance of unra unraveling the Reagan mythology is, is, is so important today. I think the Reagan 80s really uh, set us up, built the foundation for uh, the era of Trump. And uh, Gore Vidal used to call this the United States of amnesia. And I think that that is a perennial problem uh, that hurts us in our uh, polity and in our politics. Uh, we don't really understand who we are, where we came from, and uh, the media industrial complex propagates these myths. And uh, there's very little understanding of what's behind the myths. And uh, there's very uh, little comprehension of uh, really what's being uh, done to us in terms of political propaganda and uh, political styles that uh, influence the voting public. So uh, in short, we're a mess. But I think we're a mess uh, in large part because of the work that Reagan did, of course, building on the rise of the Republican right in the early 60s with Barry Goldwater. Reagan really comes from Goldwater and comes out of what was known as the paranoid style of American politics. Uh, and uh, Trump is a, a new version of that and a far more extreme one, as you pointed out in your introduction. Um, we've gone from tragedy to farce. Yeah. The, uh, it's very unusual, actually, on mainstream U.S. television uh, to have documentaries or reporting of any kind that starts to unpack Cold War mythology. And, and Reagan's very much at, at the heart of Cold War mythology. And, and so congrats not just for taking this on, but for doing it so well. Um, and by the way, I got, I knew Gore Vidal quite well. I got to know him uh, quite well in the years, a couple of years before he died. And uh, he would have appreciated uh, this series. Yeah, I should have dedicated this to Gore Vidal, who was a friend of mine. Uh, I edited a lot of his essays when I was a writer and editor at Vanity Fair. And, uh, he certainly was an influence on me. And I think the idea, incidentally, to do this probably came from Vidal because his essays on the Reagans written in the 70s and 80s, I, the most prominent one, uh, certainly my favorite is one called Ronnie and Nancy, A Life in Pictures, where he really strips the bark off them and shows you the myth. Uh, but I think a lot of that unmasking of Reagan was dismissed by the mainstream media and forgotten. And of course, the public really doesn't do a lot of deep reading. Uh, so Vidal himself and his work is largely unknown today. Well, as much as he was marginalized in the last few years of his life, be because he didn't fail to critique the Democratic Party, uh, and, and that more and more excluded him from most of the media, um, it was also, as I said in the intro, much of the Democratic Party that when Reagan died, they were falling all over themselves, uh, praising uh, Reagan. They're, they're, I think partly because they didn't want to take on the, the Cold War stuff, but also it's been they live in such fear of the people who were kind of taken in by Reagan instead of confronting it. Uh, they, they use the mythology themselves in many ways. Um, but let me let me. Let's get into sort of the story as told in your film, because to some extent it, it starts from there, which is Reagan himself was an FDR Democrat. His, his parents were, had jobs in one of the make work pro, employment programs of the FDR's New Deal. And, and so how does, how does Reagan go from this FDR uh, trade unionist, he becomes head of the Screen Actors Guild, uh, to a Goldwater Republican. What, how does that arc take place? I spent a lot of time on that in the series because I think it's really underexamined and underexplained and uh, in large part, I think, misunderstood, uh, largely because Reagan was such a good myth builder and self-mythologizer and such a good uh, writer of uh, political slogans that became, in many ways, uh, the, the, the guide rails for the American politics that we've known since the 80s. We have it in our power to begin the world over again. 
the Reagans reinforced a myth of America that hurt many, many people. The origins of his migration from left to right are, are obscured. Uh, there are myths around it. Uh, the one that he propagated that really was taken up by the media and I think uh, became a, a rather unsubstantial explanation is this slogan that he uh, put out, which is, I didn't leave the Democratic Party, the Democratic Party left me. And that kind of became the explanation. It's never really unpacked, as it were, uh, in the press. It was just a great slogan that stood for something that was, in a way, unnameable in the time. And I think the reason it was unnameable is that it really was a dog whistle. I believe that his clever use of that phrase meant that if you were excited about the civil rights movement, the Democratic Party under Lyndon Johnson, uh, who defeated Barry Goldwater, Reagan's uh, mentor in many ways, in a landslide election in 1964, that Democratic Party left you because that Democratic Party became the party of civil rights. And uh, the Democratic Party that Reagan had joined was not fully the party of civil rights, of course. It had a, a very influential Southern wing that was anything but the party of civil rights. In fact, it was the party of segregation. The question of whether my father was racist is a troubling one for me. There was a concerted effort to undermine the civil rights movement. A new language developed to trigger unacceptable social hatreds. Our city streets are jungle paths. Reagan can turn around and say, me? I didn't say anything about race. And this was FDR's Democratic coalition that had to include uh, the Democratic South in order to get legislation passed all through the New Deal period. And Reagan was a part of that party. That's part of the explanation. Uh, the other part of the explanation uh, is that Reagan was someone who was very influenceable. And uh, I think that when he was a young man, he was uh, obviously influenced by his upbringing in the, uh, the years leading to the Great Depression. He was a young man uh, during the Great Depression. And his parents had been uh, Democrats and were part of the New Deal in that his father worked for uh, one of the relief organizations. So he was really uh, kind of had that Democratic Party uh, bred into him as, uh, as a younger man. Uh, when he became president of the Screen Actors Guild, uh, there was a big red scare uh, going on in Hollywood. And uh, Reagan, I think, as head of the Screen Actors Guild, had to, he felt, take a very strong anti-communist position uh, in order to get along in Hollywood. And he really was an informant for the FBI and went along with all of the HUAC, Hollywood 10 conspiracy and uh, blacklisting maneuvers that were at large in the country. So I think that uh, he got nudged to the right in that period. His own brother was a right winger before he was and was also an FBI informant. And it was very convenient for Ronald Reagan to be an FBI informant in that period. Uh, he didn't name names in public. He named them privately to J. Edgar Hoover and his henchmen which turned out to be a rather slick career move. So I think you can see him migrating in this period, which would have been the 40s into the 50s. And then there's another moment uh, in the late 40s when he meets Nancy Davis then, who becomes Nancy Reagan, whose stepfather was a very extreme reactionary Republican uh, physician in Chicago named Loyal Davis who had uh, rather antediluvian points of view on matters of uh, race and was a uh, anti-Semite, very well known as being those things. May or may not have been kind of in the John Birch wing of the uh, Republican Party, but was certainly 
close to that. And Reagan uh, kind of absorbed a bit of that uh, political point of view starting in the 40s. And by the time the Reagan marriage to Nancy Reagan happens and he becomes an employee of General Electric uh, as his uh, movie and TV career is waning, uh, he gets another sort of shot of uh, corporatist right wing or um, Republican thinking and uh, soaks that up as well. So you can see in this is outlined in the series that Reagan was very uh, malleable and I think was very influenceable. He was going to support the rise of corporate power. This group of millionaires found in this actor the perfect frontman. And was also very willing to um, trim his sails to uh, get along in the worlds that he felt he needed to um, get along in and would allow him to rise. So this is a complicated series of events that leads to this uh, migration from left to right. And what I get from watching the show is also a, a, a very, what's the word, naked, careerist, ambitious guy. Uh, you tell the story in the series of this deal he makes when he's head of the Screen Actors Guild. Uh, I think it's for Lou Wasserman's company, who's a an agency that represents actors, but also produces shows, which is a conflict of interest. That, that kind of corruption, certainly not unusual in this kind of poli in the politics of the right. Uh, but to tell that story and, and that whole, his whole time representing General Electric is very interesting. Yes, well, again, this is a chapter, a very significant chapter of Reagan's life and career that gets overlooked. It was, uh, examined in a book called Dark Victory uh, that is mostly forgotten, uh, but was a very interesting expose of the way that Hollywood worked at the time of the Cold War and the Red Scare. And Reagan as Screen Actors Guild president was deeply involved in uh, what became a landmark antitrust uh, suit that really redefined Hollywood in the uh, mid-century. There has been a small group within the Screen Actors Guild which has consistently opposed the policy of the Guild. Agents at that time were allowed to be uh, producers and studios weren't similarly allowed to distribute their, their own films. They weren't allowed to exhibit their own films. There have been a lot of antitrust uh, regulation in, in the film industry. As agents became richer and more powerful, and uh, MCA, uh, Music Corporation of America, became the uh, dominant agency in Hollywood, uh, a man named Lou Wasserman, uh, who's generally considered to be one of the most powerful people ever in the history of Hollywood, uh, wanted to change the equation and um, tweak the regulation so uh, agents could basically become uh, producers and own movie studios in their own right. And indeed, MCA bought Universal Studios. And for years, it was known as MCA Universal. And Lou Wasserman was the uh, chairman of this company and um, ruled over Hollywood for, for decades. Lou Wasserman was Ronald Reagan's agent. And uh, when Reagan uh, became Screen Actors Guild president, it became very clear that Reagan was willing to do Wasserman's bidding. And uh, he did one huge favor for his agent. Uh, and he granted uh, a blanket waiver. It's, this is the technical term that's always used, which allowed um, the Screen Actors Guild basically endorsed uh, this agency Reagan's own MCA uh, and their ability to produce content uh, at the same time. And uh, this was an enormously beneficial uh, grant to uh, MCA. And of course you pointed out there was a conflict of interest because Reagan obviously had the, uh, the, the mantle of the Screen Actors Guild as the union leader, but he also was um, a client of uh, of the agency that benefited most from this. And uh, there was actually an antitrust uh, hearing 
uh, later in the early 60s that was uh, instigated by um, the Kennedy administration. Reagan was uh, called up as a witness and was very bitter about it. Uh, he actually was cleared of wrongdoing. Uh, we do point that out uh, in the series, but um, the, the rest of a lot of uh, his unadmirers uh, in Hollywood have long blamed him for really uh, leading the Screen Actors Guild into what ended up being a deal that wasn't really beneficial for the members of the Guild, but ended up being uh, more beneficial for management. The reason this is significant, I think, is that it shows that Reagan was very influenceable and was a careerist, as you pointed out. He was very successful, he was an unusually successful person. He came from humble beginnings uh, and really did find his own success, but he had a lot of help along the way and had a real propensity and knack for um, getting along and going along. And he had a lot of people that helped him greatly and he understood how to return these favors. So you can't fault him for looking out for number one and being unusually effective and successful in that. Uh, there's, there's something admirable there, but he also did it at the expense of others. And uh, this is frequently overlooked in accounts of Reagan's career. So I'm, I'm working on a, a documentary series now with Daniel Ellsberg and based on his book, Doomsday Machine. And he, he was talking about the extent to which the Cold War, he calls as a, was a subsidy for the American aerospace industry. Essentially a kind of corruption, like in the terms of the threat of the, of, of the threat of communism, the, the existential threat and all the rest is created for what is something kind of quite banal, money-making. And it seems to me that to some extent that's, there's a lot of that going on. And, and, and it's also true for Reagan. Like he makes, uh, in this contract he gets with General Electric, I mean, he gets a really fat salary, I guess a sort of payoff for the deal he gave them when he's head of the Screen Actors Guild. Reagan needed a big job. His film career was coming to an end. He did this big favor for MCA Universal and he is supposedly rewarded with this General Electric job. And then in addition to uh, exorbitant salary in the hundreds of thousands or the kind of, I think, mid almost $200,000 a year, which in the late 50s and early 60s was a huge amount of money, uh, they also built him a house in Pacific Palisades, which was branded the GE home of the future. And uh, he lived a kind of total GE existence. He and Nancy did extended uh, TV commercials and sort of uh, industrial documentaries for General Electric. He became a kind of living advertisement for GE. Of course, GE is uh, inextricably wed to the military industrial complex at the time. So you can see how Reagan becomes not only ideologically indoctrinated into uh, the national security state, uh, which is rising in the 50s and 60s, uh, but he becomes a, a paid spokesperson for it. I mean, it's all too perfect, really. He becomes the, the performing face of General Electric and the national security state. Uh, it was known as perpetual war for perpetual peace. This conundrum where we had to keep arming and preparing for war in order to keep the peace. And Reagan also is the poster boy for uh, that ideology. And as part of that job for General Electric in, the, in your series, uh, you show how he goes on a speaking tour of GE plants, talking to workers. And I guess this is to a large extent where he develops that character playing the guy that can talk to workers and sell them the GE message. And, and, I, and you, have, uh, you talk about the kitchen cabinet, these uh, millionaires, uh, I guess in, in those days it would be the equivalent of billionaires, uh, are always on a talent hunt, looking for political rising, potential political rising stars. 
and they identify Reagan as that. Who, who, tell us about the kitchen cabinet and, and that process of selecting Reagan. Sure. Of course, to understand Reagan, you have to look at the Republican Party that he uh, came out of and was being promoted by. Uh, the right wing of the Republican Party, which Reagan rode to great success in the 1970s and 80s, was really personified by Barry Goldwater, who was thought to be, in, by most Americans, quite frankly, an extremist kook. I mean, the extreme right wing was really a fringe faction of this country. And we see a bit of that echo today in uh, the extreme right in, in the country that Trump has uh, taken the leadership of. Uh, clearly, we can tell by the popular vote totals that at least uh, most of the country is not comfortable with that. And in the 1960s, again, most of the country was not comfortable with Barry Goldwater, who went around, as did Ronald Reagan, talking about winnable nuclear wars uh, and embraced uh, fringe kook factions like the John Birch Society which is really the forebearer of QAnon uh, and the conspiracy theory uh, uh, wing nut uh, right wing. Well, the, the antecedent of that was very much uh, alive in the 1960s and Goldwater was their candidate. Reagan did a commercial for Barry Goldwater uh, in 1964, late in the campaign. And it was called uh, A Time for Choosing. And it was a very red meat reactionary speech talking about the communist threat, saying that Medicare, which was a new program then, uh, well, actually Medicare, I don't think it had been passed, but it was being proposed as a part of the Johnson Great Society. And Reagan was calling Medicare a totalitarian program and uh, go, not even calling it communist. I mean, he was taking it to its, its farthest extreme. So he's taking these very far out positions. Or as we were told a few days ago by the president, we must accept a greater government activity in the affairs of the people. But they've been a little more explicit in the past and among themselves and all of the things I now will quote have appeared in print. These are not Republican accusations. For example, they have voices that say the Cold War will end through our acceptance of a not undemocratic socialism. NBC aired this uh, infomercial, basically, where Reagan gives the speech to a sort of fake, a mock political convention. And the ratings were quite high and the dollars rolled in. It was a, a fundraising uh, commercial and there was an appeal. Of course, at that time you had to call a number, I think even send in a check to uh, an address and the checks really rolled in and it was enormously successful. Send one, ten, fifty dollars or any amount to TV for Goldwater Miller, Box 80, Los Angeles 51. I repeat, TV Goldwater Miller, Box 80, Los Angeles 51. When Goldwater went down to a landslide defeat against Lyndon Johnson. The right wing backers of Goldwater, mostly out of the West and mostly in California, saw that Reagan was a very effective spokesman for a set of ideas that they wanted to sell. And these were reactionary, anti-tax, anti-regulation, anti-communist and anti-civil rights ideas, concepts that they were all for. And they very quickly latched on to Reagan, this washed up actor who they saw was an effective communicator for those sets of ideas that they wanted to put forth. And they put him up to running for governor of California in 1966, and he won. And he won against a New Deal politician named Pat Brown, who is the father of Jerry Brown. And um, it was a, a big shock to the political system. And it really set us on the course that was fully realized in the 1980s when Reagan finally ascended to the presidency. So thanks for now for joining us, Matt. Thank you, see you next time. Yeah, and thank you for joining us on the analysis.news podcast.